Thank you, Lord, for being here. We've come to worship you. We love you. For two or more are gathered in my name, so I'm here. I am here. I am here. We adore you. We are grateful for you. And we worship you now. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Word is your name, Jesus. Today's scripture reading is from Psalm 51. It can be found in your red Bible on page 405. Truly, 
given it to God. And we thank you so very much. Just another little note, Andrew, Richard Andrews will be providing the worship service on February the 4th. So please come and support Mr. Andrews. He, he has a wonderful musical ministry and he found the Lord while he was in prison. And so he knows the toils in which the Lord delivered him from. And he sings freely to God. So please come Amen. and support him. Also on February the 4th, we will be hosting, Hope Center of Christ will be hosting the pastor gathering at Christ's Cathedral. I can't say it without saying the Christmas Cathedral. In the Arboretum on February the 4th, at 6 p.m. Please come out and support. I know we're saying it's a pastor, it's the pastor's gathering, but it's for all. Please come and support your pastors. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I thank you very much. And we give God the glory. Dear Heavenly Father, you're wonderful and you're worthy to be praised. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Wow, I'm looking out and seeing an army. Yeah, I am. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Debbie. Lord Jesus Christ, right now, open our hearts and our minds and our ears, our spirits to hear your word. Sometimes your word is easy, sometimes it's not. <laughs> but your word is always good. It's always good. And so, Lord, I pray that your word will go forth and will not return void. Thank you, Lord. Guide me as your spokeswoman <laughs> today. In the name of Jesus. Well, church, I never thought I would see the days like we are seeing today. Amen? And that is true in more ways than one. On one side, I see evil, rampant evil. But on the other side, I see God moving powerfully, more powerfully than I've ever seen him move in my life. So we need to be encouraged, church. We need to not close our eyes to the evil, but we also need to recognize and pray for more and more and more of God's power and deliverance. Amen? Amen. So despite what you see or fail to see, be encouraged. Because God moves when he moves, and he is, nothing can stop him. You know this. You've heard me say this. And so we've been studying the book of Esther the last two Sundays, and I'm bringing it home today. The first week, we learned a vital role, vital role, vital role that Mordecai played in the story. In fact, there would be no Esther without Mordecai. The Esther movement that God has put in motion today, and he has put an Esther movement in motion today, it depends on the Mordecais. It depends on you men supporting us women through prayer, through encouragement, through understanding. And we know that and God has done that. You guys have all taken stands, a physical stance and said, yes, I will be a Mordecai. I will support this movement. I will. When we study Mordecai, we learned that Mordecai had so much faith in the Almighty that he even encouraged his niece, his guardian, Guard. He was supposed to guard her life. He even encouraged her to risk her life because he trusted that God would save her and be with her throughout that time. That's a strong faith. That's the kind of faith we need from our Mordecai today. He also never left the king's gates. In other words, he stayed by her side. He stayed, stayed by the king's side in prayer, in a prayerful prayerful posture. This was his protective stance. A prayerful posture, man, is a protective stance. That just came from the Lord. So it bears repeating. A prayerful posture 
is the most protected sphinx. So thank you. Thank you, men, for doing that. As a result, he overheard the assassination plot that, re that preserved Esther's position, which ultimately led to an amazing promotion for him. So week one, we studied the character Mordecai because it's important. It's important for us, and especially you men, to know what a vital role you play today in these days. Last week, we discussed it was week two, Haman. We learned that Haman's intent was no less than the total extermination of the Jewish race. Total extermination of the Jewish people. That was his intent. And it was not the only time in history that we have seen this, but we learned that Haman's attack was a spiritual demonic attack. We know that. And Satan's intent was to eradicate the seed of Christ. If there were no Jewish people left, there would be no seed of Christ from the Davidic line. That's what was at stake. This whole book, that's what was at stake. And although the Almighty preserved the seed, and we know that, that Christ was born, Christ died, Christ has returned to heaven, he defeated death. This should have put the full, an end to the full court press against the royal seed, specifically the Jewish seed, but it did not. And so you may be asking yourself, how, why? Why does it still continue today? Right? And that's a valid question. The, the answer is Christ will return. Christ will return. But there needs to be According to the book of Revelation, there needs to be a Jewish nation for Christ to return. Right? The restoration of, and, and that's why when Israel became a nation back in 1940, I get my Seven. numbers wrong, but it's 1947 or 848, yes. It was 1948 when it became a Jewish nation. That was pivotal. That was the number one prophecy that was foretold, and nobody thought it would be possible ever. It's a miracle. And then it's under attack today for, the re for that reason, because Satan understands all of this. So Jerusalem, the Israel nation, is important for Christ's return. And this tiny little nation that is surrounded by mighty, powerful enemies, their main ally is who? America. It's America. And so that's why that same spirit of payment that's been attacking Israel today through Hamas, first it was through Adolf Hitler, now it's through Hamas, also has been attacking the America. We've seen it in our colleges and universities. I, I touched on this last week. That's why. It's to prevent Christ being able to return. So we see the spirit of Haman is still at work. But we also saw, what did we see last year, last week? That God had the last word, right? When, it, when evil abounds, when evil is flourishing, fret not, because God will have the last word. He flipped the tables on Haman and Haman, right? And so we're going to continue with that story today and, uh, and so but we know that so what happens so there's an eight so we're looking at okay today there's this insidious attack this Haman spirit and has been uh, at work we've seen it in the nations it's currently the reason why the spiritual war that is behind the earthly war that we're seeing what was God's answer to this Haman attack Esther. Esther was his answer. Who do you think his answer is against this payment attack? More Esthers. Right. That is why we are seeing, without a doubt, a huge rising up like a tidal wave, like a tsunami wave, and it's been building in America, and it is, it is taking on momentum 
This, these waves, these tidal waves are getting ready to crest. And these, these tidal waves are thousands, and we're looking and we're expecting a million esters to rise up because this is God's movement to save America Amen. so America can save Israel. Amen. You all understand what's at stake? And who is the royal seed today? You are. Because as it says in Scripture, in Ephesians, it tells you this. That when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You are. You reign with him. You are seated. It says that you are seated with him on the throne. You've been given the full power and authority. You are the royal seed today that will keep this movement alive, that keeps his kingdom, that prays his kingdom to come from heaven here on earth. You are the royal seed. You are the royal seed, as are the children. This is why we see the attack on the children. And again, what has God done? He's raised up an Esther movement. Jenny Donnelly's Don't Mess With Our Kids movement. The book that God had me write, Praying for the Children. Is it any coincidence, just a coincidence, that I would happen to meet Jenny Donnelly, who's got her Don't Mess With Our Kids prayer movement, and Sheila Coleman with her Heart of a Warrior, Praying for the Kids International movement, and now who has linked arm in arm, praying to prayer, prayer to prayer, friends, Jenny Donnelly and Sheila Coleman. Tell me that demons don't tremble. <laughs> yeah, that's what God is doing. Hallelujah. Be encouraged, church. Be encouraged. And so let's delve once again to this book of Esther. This time we're going to focus on Esther. And this is the last time I'll be preaching on it for some time. Esther 1-1, one, one. we're not going there yet. Esther 1-1 one, one begins with a 180-day feast. Who would like to go to a 180-day feast? I don't think I would. I think I would burst if I did that. But they had a 180-day feast for King Ahasuerus. He's not, a, he's a pagan king. You understand that, right? He's a pagan king. Yet, God is using him to deliver his children. Watch and see. But King Ahasuerus, he put forth a royal command to his queen Vashti, come, make an appearance, because you're so beautiful, I want everybody to see what a beautiful wife I have. Wear the crown I gave you to. While you're at it, he wants to show off her amazing beauty. For some unknown reason, I can't begin to fathom why, unless it was divine, but Queen Vashti refused. She refused. And this didn't end well for her. She lost her crown. She didn't lose her head that we know of. But she lost her crown and her position as queen. That created a vacancy, which had to be filled. So the call went forth to the entire empire to find the most beautiful women. They all had to be virgins. To be brought to the harem. Now the harem was not the palace. So we're going to talk more about that today. And while they're in this harem, kind of a holding place, one of those women would be chosen to be the next queen of the empire. This empire, as you've heard me say, stretched from Ethiopia to India. This is a big, huge, this is a big, huge. King Ahasuerus is also considered called the King Xerxes, Prince of Persia, Prince of Persian Empire. And Hadassah was this very lovely, must have been very beautiful Jewish girl, an orphan. And her uncle Mordecai became her guardian. He encouraged her to let no one know that she was a Jew. And so this is how this Jewish orphan found herself in the Persian king's harem. Her beauty, which God gave her, knowing she would need it to fulfill her call for such a time as this. 
While she was in the harem, she was put under the care of Haggai, a eunuch who watched over the women. And as I said, the king's harem was not the palace. This part is what I find fascinating. And there's some strong spiritual principles embedded within it. It was not the palace, but it was a place of preparation. A place of preparation. The harem was a place of preparation. It was a place of purification. It was a place of getting them ready to meet the king. Now, ladies, this was not just a day at the spa. This process took an entire year. The first six months were myrrh treatments. Myrrh was a very expensive perfume obtained from trees in Africa and southern Asia. Why? Six months of such fragrant treatments. It took time. It took time. Time. Soaking in the fragrance. Time. Soaking in the fragrance. Over time, the essence of myrrh saturated her very being. Myrrh was used for healing. Myrrh was used as incense that was burned to bring in the presence of God. Not necessarily in the harem, but it was in the temples. Myrrh was used as fragrance. Six months of this soaking. Soaking in myrrh. This was followed with another six months of spices and ointments. So by the time she had soaked and basked in the purification process, she now carried the essence of the king. Are any of you hearing any double meanings in any of this? If you haven't, don't worry, because I'm going to go into it and explain to you what I feel the Lord has re revealed about the symbolism that is inherent in all of this, women, because we are Esther's all today. Much to speak. The symbol of this latent in this, and it has to do with our relationship with the King of Kings. Our relationship with the King of Kings. When Esther was chosen, she was plucked from the streets. Her skin, her hair, her teeth, her nails likely needed quite a bit of purification. But, I hope you hear this carefully, she was put into the harem as she was. Plucked from the streets and put into the harem as she was. You say it one more time. Plucked from the streets and put into the harem as she was. Similarly, when Christ plucks us from our lives that are far from holy, he takes us as we are and he enters our lives, dirt and all. All of us, all of us have it, right? But once he enters our lives, we begin a purification process. St. Paul refers to it as sanctification. As we begin to walk with Christ, we begin a life that is completely different than what it was before. And some of you, I know your life has been totally transformed by Jesus Christ. I know mine has been. The more we soak in his presence, the more we soak in his word, the more like Christ we become. And we begin to carry his fragrance. We begin to carry his essence. This is a purification process that happens mainly by soaking. Just soaking. Be good. That's what we do when before church starts. We soak in the presence of the Lord. We just soak it. I do that every morning. I begin my day with soaking in the Lord. It's called soaking music, and it means you just sit still and be with him. And read his word and just soak in who he is. 
And it means choosing to soak over the pull of the flesh and the demands of life. It means giving him our hearts, our lives, our time, right? Did you hear me say that the emphasis on time? <coughs> us to have us to soak to the myrrh for six months because it took time. It takes time. But it's a beautiful, blessed time. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. And when we do, when we do, our lives automatically are purified. And we become so much like him that we carry his essence wherever we go. So the justification, justification, St. Paul refers to, that's when we say yes to Jesus. And it means that we've been saved from our death sentence to a life sentence. When we say yes, Jesus, we get our life sentence. Thank you, Lord. And then we soak in him, and we are purified, and we begin to carry his essence. The justification leads to the sanctification, which leads to the glorification. Where we carry his glory. We see this same process Esther goes through. First she was justified, plucked from the streets and put into the palace. And then she's followed by sanctification, a year of being purified. And then she was taken in to see the king. After a year, a whole year. She was brought into the royal palace. It says that she was winning favor while she was in the hair and going through this entire purification process. The same favor follows her when she goes before the king. And then we see this purification, this divine destiny for such a time as this, for such a time as this. I would dare say to any Christian woman of God today, that you, God, created you divinely. He destined you before the foundation of the earth for such a time as this. This is our divine destiny. This is our divine assignment. And it led to her being chosen as queen of the mighty Persian Empire. Indeed, it says when the king met her, in Esther 2.17, I'm just going to read this to you. We're going to open our Bibles in a minute. The king loved Esther more than all the women. She won the grace and favor in his sight more than all the others, so that he set the royal crown on her head and he made her queen. Imagine, imagine, little Hadassah, plucked from the streets, and this is the glory of now the crown. So we go from plucked to purification to crowned. So Esther is moved to the palace. You see, she's no longer in the harem. Now she's in the palace. And when Esther was in the harem, Mordecai paced outside it day and night. Remember, he never left her side. And now that she's been moved to the palace, Mordecai takes his new place sitting at the king's gate. And it was there he overheard the plot to assassinate the king. I know we've said this before, but we've got to go through the whole story just a little bit. As a result, Mordecai is recorded as a hero, and Esther's position is saved. Now, it was after this that Haman, the mortal enemy of the Jews, was promoted, and what a promotion, to second in command to King Ahasuerus over this entire empire, from Ethiopia to India. Haman, who carries within him the intent to kill all the Jews, is promoted to second in command. He's even given the signet ring of the king and is entitled to issue royal edicts, which he did. This is what he did. First thing he did. The edict this is what it said. Destroy, kill, annihilate all Jews. Young and old, women and children, over the next year, and everybody who does that will be rewarded. Paid assassinations of all the Jews. He said, if it takes a whole year, it takes a whole year. I want them all gone. This is the spirit of Haman. And so we come to probably the most memorable scene of this story, this book. We haven't talked about this yet in the previous two. To Sunday, so turn to Esther 4, or page 356. 
Esther 4, we'll start the first verse, or page 356. So this edict, and while you're doing that, looking it up, Esther 4, 356, Mordecai has heard about this edict. Destroy, kill, and annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children. I'll pay you all kinds of money. Even if it takes a year, I want to walk on. So here's what it says in Esther 4, verse 1. When Mordecai learned all of this had happened, he tore his clothes and put on a sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate. He couldn't enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Verse 4. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Remember, nobody knows she's a Jew. Then she sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Hetak, one of the king's eunuchs whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. So Hetak went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate. Verse 7 says, Mordecai told him all that had happened, and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. Verse 8 says, he also gave him a copy of the written decree. So he's not just, this is just not word of mouth, okay? Mordecai's also giving him, had talk, a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her, Esther, to go into the king, to make supplication to the king, and plead before the king for her people. No one knows she's a Jew. So Hetak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Hmm. Verse 10. Then Esther spoke to Hetak, gave him a command from Mordecai. Tell Mordecai all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been summoned or called. He has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he might live. I myself have not been called to go into the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's response. Verse 13, Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. I'm going to pause there a minute. Esther thought because she was in the palace, she would be spared. Too many of us today think that we are safe in our palaces and will be spared. Some fathers and mothers have put their children in private Christian schools. Some of them have put them in home schools. Some of them, they bring them to church, even if you're in church. Do not think that because you're in the palace that your life will necessarily be saved. Don't fear. Amen. But it's important to understand that we cannot deceive ourselves. We don't want to be sitting ducks, as God has said. So I'm going to read that again. So verse 13 says, And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your hearts, I mean, this is repeating this, that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. Verse 14 says, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. 
Jenny Donnelly has a slogan on her t-shirts and hats that says, silence is not safe. Church, we've been able to, me included, we've been able to, to be safe. We've been able to be silent and still safe. I'm not sure we live in those days anymore. <clears throat> We have to follow God, we have to be wise, we have to use discernment, but when the Lord says speak up or take a stand, we may need to do that, regardless of the risk. This is what Esther was being asked to do. As Esther's today, living in what we're living through, you, we, surely this story resonates, does it not? It does with me. It fills me with fear and trembling. Good fear and trembling, but still fear and trembling, because I recognize this is God saying, Sheila, <laughs> Sheila, these are the days. These are days. Mordecai then utters these historic words right there in 14. Who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Hallelujah. And indeed she was. So, continuing, I've never read such a long passage in one sitting, but bear with me, church. Verse 15, then Esther told them, <coughs> reply to Mordecai, go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king. I will go to the king, she says. Think of it. I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Verse 17, so Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. So these red esters that God is raising up, women who are willing to speak up no matter what others say about them, it is risky. It is risky. They call you all kinds of names. But women, when they are backed into a corner, when they reach the enough is enough, and especially when it is their children who are at risk, I'm a grandma, and my grandchildren are at risk. Tell me, I don't, I'm not aware of it, of course I am. And I heard a pastor say not too long ago, he took his daughter to the Holocaust Museum. I've not been there. But apparently there's a room there, and all that's left are these little shoes of children. The children are gone, but the shoes, that's all that's left of them. It's a room filled with sh children's shoes. And the, 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 the daughter looks up at her dad, and she says, Daddy, why didn't somebody do something? I never want my grandchildren to say in the crowd, why didn't you do something? God is asking a lot. He's asking a lot of me, but not just me, but he's asking a lot of me. And every time he asks, I say yes. Every time. <laughs> They're adding their one on top of another, and they're not small. These are big assignments. But it doesn't matter because I know that God will only ask me what He will help me do. And I also stop and I think, Jesus gave His life for me. How can I not say yes? How can I not say yes? How can I not quick go out and buy a plane ticket? It doesn't matter how much it costs. And jump in a car and drive roads. I don't know where I'm driving in the rain. Going I don't know where. All alone by myself. It doesn't matter the cost. It doesn't matter how, what, how much work it is. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. And I just always say, God, I'm so grateful. You know I will say yes. 
And I'm going to share with you some of the other yeses that he's been asking of me just within the last few days. More. He's not taking anything off my plate. And that's okay with me. Because I will not let the baton of Christianity in America be dropped. Because once it's dropped, that's it. That's it. I will do whatever I have to do, whatever God asks me to do, to make sure that the baton of Christianity is passed to Gen Alpha, which is my grandchildren's generation. I'll do whatever I have to do, whatever God asks me to do. I will not be silent. I will not back down. I cry out because these are God's kids. They're His children. So God is moving. He's connecting. And I'm just so amazed. It's like a, I think I shared with you, it's like a, a chessboard, right? A chessboard. And like I, and I'm going to take you, for example, and you know, he's been moving me this chess piece around. <laughs> he moves me here, and he moves me there. And then he moves me over there, and he moves me over there. See, that's the thing when God positions you. Because mm. it's all about the position. When God positions you where he needs you the most. For a time. And you think, oh, he's positioned me here. Oh, this is where I am. This is where I stay. This is where I'll be. Not. This is where you are for now because it gets you closer to where he wants to move you over here. Oh, now that I'm over here, now I can, now I you meet somebody so I can position you over here. <coughs> you see? And that and I've been living this. This is my this is my life's message that you're getting from me today. First he had me write the book. That was the first position. You've all gone on that journey with me. Then he moved me to Kenya. Only for 10 days. I could have stayed much longer, but I had a whole family waiting for me here, not to mention this church. And then when I returned from Kenya, I thought I was going to Mexico, but he did. He said, no, not yet. And he said, the reason is, not because of safety, but because of America. He said, Sheila, you need to focus on America. America is in its last stand. So, that's what you, that's why you, then the next thing you know, he moved me to go to Dallas, where he connected me to Jenny Donnelly and others. And this is what's doing. He's been moving me around and moving me around and moving me around. And um, now there's other things that has happened just this week. We see the same in Esther. Esther was moved from the streets to the harem, and she was moved from the harem to the palace, and she was given the position, the position of queen. So we see that while she was there, we're going back to Esther now, away from Sheba. While guarding her at the king's gate, Mordecai has moved to the king's gate. When she moved to the, to the palace, he moved to the king's gate. Is there he overheard the assassination plot, and he was promoted. And, it was, and his heroic deed was put into the book of heroic deeds. Heroic deeds. So, let me see, I need to go where I got lost. So, Esther, praying and fasting. Praying and fasting is really, really, really important because it's important in this Jenny Donnelly movement. When we're in times like this, we need to pray and we need to fast. We need to pray and we need to fast. That was why he showed her the favor. That was her yes, her obedience, her yes. And I know you all pray. If you're like me, you don't fast any more than you have to. That's a giggle. <laughs> you can feel free to giggle. Um, and so what, what does that mean, fasting? Well, that can mean there's many, many different ways of fasting, and we'll get into that more as we get into, in, uh, for another Sunday. But I personally am fasting 
every Friday. I feel called to do that, to just fast every Friday. And so that varies. I usually get up in the morning and I go, Lord, show me how you want me to fast today. Sometimes it'll be skip breakfast. Sometimes it'll be skip breakfast and lunch. Other times it'll be, I don't want you to have any sugar, I don't want you to have any chocolate. No refined sugar or chocolate. And I can tell you why. Because some days my body needs more than others. I can tell you that. And so I, I follow what he says and I do it for the day. However long he tells me to. I fast. Others do, they fast social media, they fast other things. But I really like to do fast some kind of a food because it's the pull of the flesh. And when you do some, when you have that temptation, and, and this is the interesting about it, it's like, oh wait, I want that little piece of chocolate. Oh wait, no, 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 no. Today is the day of prayer fasting against chocolate. It reminds me to pray. And it also shows Satan that the pull of the flesh has no uh, no weight on me. Shows that he can't get me. That I'm stronger than the pull of the flesh. And it strengthens that discipline. So that's that's behind that's so as the church prays and fasts, as we men and women say yes despite the cost, God will show favor. Mm. <laughs> to you personally and to our church. He will extend his royal scepter of mercy and grace to our country. Do we not need that? He will hear our cries and save and rescue his children. And not only that, he will promote. What happened when Esther went before the king? The king extended the scepter. But when she was there, she did not just blurt out, Haman is trying to destroy us. Remember, he has no idea who us is. The king has no idea that she's a Jew. Neither does he. She had to be very sly. She had to follow a divine strategy for how and what to say to the king when she went to go and see him. First, she risked her life. She went to go and see him. And when he saw her and he said, hey, what are you doing here? But he saw her. He had faith. She had favor because of the prayer and fasting. So he extended the scepter and says, come, what do you want? Esther, I always thought this story was she just said, save us, save us, save us, save That's not what she did. You heard this story part of last week. I know I'm jumping around. I'm trying to put it all together for you in a sequence today. So thank you for bearing with me. She said, talk about sly, because this, the chess game is now underway. All right? And in any, game, any chess game, there's a surprise move that is hidden until the time is right. So Esther told the king, as I told you last week, she said, I would like to prepare a private banquet for you and Haman. Remember this story that I told last week? Haman hears about it. Wow! The queen's going to do a private banquet for me and the king. He rushes home to his family and says, guess what? Guess what? And then he races back to, the, as he read this, rushing from the palace home, he passes Mordecai, who's sitting up there in sackcloth and ashes, refusing to bow to him. He already hates Mordecai, but now he's so irate, as we talked about last week. He ordered a towering gallows for Mordecai, a towering gallows that matched his towering rage against Mordecai to be hung on the next morning. Also, as we learned last week, the night before the hanging, the king couldn't sleep, and he says, hey, bring those heroic deep books to me and read to me to help me go to sleep. And then, as they were reading, he hears the story of Mordecai, who uncovered the assassination plot against him. He says, hey, this Mordecai, what's been done to honor him? Hey, what should I do to honor a man? How would you honor a man? 
came to thinking is for him. Remember, church? He gives him this wonderful, elaborate parade and this and that and royal, royal robes to wear, thinking he's going to receive it. But who? But what happens is the king says, "Great, great plan. I want you to do it for Mordecai." And that's what happened. Now, that was not the end of the story. So, he's done this. He was mortified. He was mortified by Mordecai. <laughs> Good word, Lord. He was, I just, that just came and he just dropped in there. Just dropped in there. He was mortified by Mordecai. Mortified by Mordecai. I just love the Lord. Isn't he funny? He has such a great sense of humor. I giggle a lot with him. I just love him. Thank you, Lord. Ooh, we needed that. And meanwhile, Esther's preparing the feast. The private feast for him and the king. It's a prime example of the Lord. We should read in Psalm 23 what? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This is what Esther is doing, and God's having her do it. The Lord is guiding her footsteps beyond dishonoring Haman. That's not enough. Dishonoring Haman is not near enough, is it? That's not going to save the Jews from this royal edict that has been put forth and cannot be nullified. That's the end goal that God has, to rescue and deliver all of his children. It's not enough today with the, with the attempt to steal, kill, and destroy the children of the world to just dishonor their enemies. God has to bring an end to the plot. He has to erase and cancel the edict that's gone forth in the spiritual realm. You understand, right, church? This is why the story's not over yet. So turn to Esther 7, page 357. It's a longer message than usually. You're doing great hanging in there. Verse 1, Esther 7, verse 1. Page 357, Esther 7, verse 1. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day, at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? What do you want? It will be granted to you. What is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. Verse 3 said, Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, if it pleases the king, let my life be given me and my petition and my people and my request. For we have been sold as male and female slaves. Had we, oh, sorry, we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed. Verse 4, let me start at the beginning because my, my, I jumped down, my eyes fell down too far. Verse 4, for we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed to be killed and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue. As bad as it is to sell slaves, right? This is more than that. She said, had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. Verse 5 says, King Ashwar's answer said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he that he would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman who is sitting there thinking he's got this wonderful feast. Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Verse 7, Then the king arose in his wrath and from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden, but Haman stayed behind. He stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. And verse 8 says, when the king returned from the palace garden, 
to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I'm in the house? As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now, Arbono, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows, fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai. Mm. Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, the gallows, fifty cubits high, standing in the house of Haman. And the king said, Haman. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai and the king's wrath. Society. Now, this is not a message about um, pain. <laughs> it's about God having the last word and letting it be good, okay? And there's different ways to do that. But the problem is that even though he has been hung, the edict has still been sent forth, and it's still in effect. So Haman was dishonored, he's hung, and the edict is still there. It had to be negated. So Esther pleaded with the king yet again. She pleaded with the king to set forth a new edict that negated Haman's, which he did. Not only that, the king dressed Mordecai, he dressed Mordecai in royal robes and put his signet ring on Mordecai. Mordecai is now, look what God does. Mordecai is now second in command to the king. He's wearing the signet ring and he puts the seal, boom. This edict is boom, hereby, boom, negated, boom. The royal signet ring. <sighs> the book of Esther concludes with this. Now Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus, and he was great among the Jews, popular with the magnitude of his brothers, for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. What a story. What a story. It begins with purification. It begins with purification. It begins with soaking in the presence of God. It begins. And with that, we get a new position close to God. We dwell. When that happens, we have, He gives us His power, His presence. His presence and His power. His protection. His protection and gives us position. He gives us position. He promotes us. Sometimes in the natural, sometimes in the supernatural. Frequently both. But he promotes because the position. He needs you to be in a position. He needs you to be in that position. So church, soak. Soak. Soak in his fragrance. Soak in the myrrh. Soak in it every day until you begin to carry his essence wherever you go. And when you do, you're going to carry. That's, a, that's your protection. That's your protection. Sit at the king's gate. That's where the soaking comes first. Sit at the king's gate. The myrrh is healing his presence and his fragrance. And God, the rest, he just does. I don't, I get up in the morning and I have a list of things to do now. But frequently, my morning will be disrupted with a text. What's this morning? Bright and early. Sheila. Da, 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 da. And these text messages, I get different people, but they're not questions. They're an assignment. <laughs> it's not worded with a question mark. Sheila, will you, will you consider me perfectly do this? It's Sheila. Do da 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 da. Here. That's it. And so then I, I go before the Lord and go, Lord, is this something you want me to do? But I'm telling you, it's that easy. It's that easy.
It's God's divine strategy. <clears throat> I'm just the chess piece. He moves me here today, moves me over here tomorrow, moves me over here today. Still the same with you. Don't think it's just me. Don't think it's just me. He's positioning us to where he needs us the most for such a time as this. So church, I just want to you know, bring this home a minute right now. Because we need to act, we need to pray, we need to fast. I encourage you strongly, I know you're all praying. This is a praying church, this is a house of prayer. So that I'm not even worried about. I've trained you how to pray, you know how to pray. But consider adding fasting one day a week. I'm doing Friday. Consider it. Fast with me on Fridays. Whatever that is. You can just ask the Lord. He'll show you. He'll tell you what to do. And just do it. There's a freedom trip coming up for February 9 and 10 at Angela's Temple. Any of you women who can go or want to go, I encourage you to go. It's going to be powerful. It's free. It'll cost you some gas to drive up to Pasadena, uh, to uh, Los Angeles and back. Join the, the prayer house on the Esther movement. Join them. Because we, as we pray in one accord, there's a prayer, there's prayer points. As we pray in one accord with all these other prayer hubs across that country, there's something powerful in that, you understand? It's not that what you're praying isn't okay, but by you adding your voice to all the others, we're all praying as one giant army. <laughs> and that Friday fast, join me in that. Last but not least, there's, I got this came across my, an early morning text. Dear, dear, dear. And don't be discouraged, but may it fuel you up a little bit. It's a it's a picture of a flyer. I have to put my readers on because it's very, very tiny. It's a flyer, it's colorful, it's got crayons along the side. And it says, hey kids, let's have fun at after school. Satan fun. Science and Community Service Projects. Puzzles and games, nature activities, arts and crafts, snacks, and tons of fun. Parents, your child will learn benevolence and empathy, critical thinking, problem solving, creative expression, personal sovereignty, and compassion. You understand the enemy doesn't have a single creative thought. He's counterfeit, but he takes frequently, frequently, frequently takes the creator and twists it. That's what he does. That's all he can do. This is being. This was passed out at an elementary school in San Clemente just recently, and I can tell you it's national because I've been seeing and hearing about this for some time. But I, this is the first actual flyer that I had had been sent to me and has is in my backyard. God has put schools on my heart. We all know that. And there's so many different iterations of how to educate our children. And I'm here to tell you that God is as concerned about our public schools as he is everything. And he wants to take back our public schools. Amen? Amen. He wants to take them back. We cannot. We, we cannot. We, we can't just turn a blind eye to the children who are in our public schools and think that the only way to save, uh, have a good, solid education is to have private Christian education. A lot of parents can't afford it. It's not okay for private Christian education for to be open to, for a Christian education to only be for those who can afford it. And so, what do we do? Well, I'm I mean, see now this, this chess, this chess board that God's had me on for some time. Last fall already, he said, Sheila, I want you to start, I'm going to tell you what they are, I want you to start, no, they're, they, they, they're in place, but I want you to begin to mobilize the implementation of these in the public schools in Orange County. Nice. And he said, what I want you to do, first of all, is he said, I want you to go to every single pastor gathering 
I invite you to. So last fall, I would get an invitation to this pastor gathering, to that pastor gathering, and this pastor gathering. I would never, you know, this is a relatively recent phenomenon for me to be invited to all these pastor gatherings. But God wanted me there. So I got the invitations. I would pop up, pop up, pop up. I go, okay, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Didn't matter how late I came in from a flight the night before, I get up the next morning and I would go. Anyway, and I did that because he said, you need to, I want you to meet and connect with as many pastors in Orange County as you can. Why? Because, and I knew this was coming, I was already had this, this plan in place before I saw this flyer. He said, come the first part of January, I want you to start implementing good news clubs at public schools in Orange County. Amen. Good news clubs fall under the umbrella of Child Evangelism Fellowship. These are really, really, really good, good news clubs. They are valuable, they're wonderful, they're, they're legal. And so, that's why last Sunday there was a young woman who visited us. She has another church here in the city of Orange. She needs to be there because we need her church helping. We need as many churches. That's why God's had me going on all of these church pastor gatherings, you see. Because if every church, if every church said, we'll send one volunteer to be trained in Good News Club. How many Good News Clubs could there be Lots. in Orange County? Lots. And that, and it'll, and it'll grow from there. So Sophia was here last week, and she, I met her at one of these pastor gatherings. She's not a pastor, but she was there representing the church. And I mentioned Good News Clubs, and she and I had lunch together just three days before she came and visited us, and she was just overwhelmed. She said, Sheila, this is important to me. I've done these in Seattle. These are important. I want to help however I can. But when I get, when this came across my, this flyer came across my text message the other morning, I right away called my friend and I said, I need the name of the people that are the head of Child Evangelism Fellowship and Good News Clubs in Orange County because now it's time to move. <clears throat> Hallelujah. 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 I got a text back from them. I texted them and said, we need to meet. <laughs> they said, Again, it was not a question. We'll see you Monday morning at such and such a place. I look at my calendar. Yeah, it's free. Boy, mm, it's a full day, right? But I will be there tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, we're meeting, and we're going to. Then I'm going to tell them I have pastor friends throughout all of Orange County, and I'm going to call on each and every one of them. Please. Please, someone in your church, say yes to do a good news club. Just think of it. Tomorrow, I first have to meet with them. What does that mean? How many days a week? Is it once a month? I have no idea. But I know they're powerful. I know they're powerful. They don't cost us a dime, church. They cost us our time. He's worth that time, like Esther, that time, a whole year of purification. He's worth that time. So pray for him. Amen? All right. I hope you're encouraged. Yes. Because I am. And as I'm watching God move, and I've seen his divine plan unfold like he did with Esther. All of the Jews were saved. Stand for uh, Thank you. You've been very patient today. That was a longer message than I like to hear. We needed to bring it home because next Sunday, Pastor's got a powerful word for you. And the first Sunday, February 4th, born in 2024, on the 4th of 2024, February, we 
We've got Richard Andrews here, and we've got there, we're going back to the Crystal Cathedral, Christ Cathedral at 6 p.m. That's that night. We're going back again that night because we're celebrating that God is letting us come back home again, a homecoming. And um, and so that's what that's what's happening. And so I'm I'm super excited about what God is doing. And uh, yeah, let's pray. Uh, Father, we come together now as a church, as a, as a mighty army, and we decree and we declare that the Spirit of Haman, that he is a forever loser. And we, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you will deploy your angel host as many as possible, as many as possible, to take down the enemy. Thank you, Lord, that you are doing this. Thank you, Lord. And we also ask now, Abba, that you will negate, ooh, yeah, negate the edicts that have been set forth. Those edicts that have been set, sent forth with the power of God, Power, the authority and dominion that has been given to me as the daughter of the Most High God, I now hereby decree a cancellation of those edicts. And with the signet ring that God allows all of us, you and I, to wear, I hereby sign, boom, the edict, the edict that cancels, the edict to send, that's been sent forth to destroy and kill the children of the world and in America. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We take it that this has happened to Telestai. It is now finished. We will see an end. We will see an end. And there will be no more destruction. No more destruction. No more destruction in the name of Jesus. And now, may, you, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he give you the courage of Esther and Mordecai to say yes <coughs> to whatever he asks us to do. We give you faith that is unshakable, hope that is unshakable, love that is unquenchable. Church, God loves you. He's also very, 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 very pleased with you. And so am I. Amen.